I'm trying to think of a good joke about how to tell about the size of the turnout. So the only joke I can come up with is this. 10 years ago, 11 years ago, and I, wait, let me just say something before I start. I am not a cryptocurrency speculator. I don't own cryptocurrency. I need to tell you that. But 10, 11 years ago, Bitcoin was going for a buck, maybe two. If you bought 100 shares today, none of us would be here. <laughs> All right? So welcome to the future. Welcome to the future. All right, so here's the deal. I come, I come to, the purpose of this talk is I do not come to praise DLT or blockchain. As I said, I'm not into cryptocurrency speculation. I just don't believe in it. A whole lot of reasons for that. But I have an insatiable curiosity to understand how things work. So what I'm gonna to try to do is at a very high level explain what all this stuff is about to you. So that's the purpose of this talk. It really is I want to explain blockchain, distributed ledger technology, and I'm going to do it in terms of DevOps because it, has a, it is going to have a real big impact on DevOps. Um, so this is the agenda. Who am I? I'm going to talk about the elephant in the living room. <clears throat> I'm going to do the bottom line. I'm going to do a little blockchain DLT 101 so we have a baseline understanding. I'm going to talk about working with wallets and smart contracts. I'm going to do the NFT stuff. I'm going to create a blockchain right before your very eyes. I'm going to talk about the programming stuff. And then I'm going to get to the DevOps stuff and the issues. And if we have time, um, I do have a bonus demo. I do have a lot of demos, so I'm really going to be testing the will of the demo gods in here. And anything can go wrong. Uh, just to give you a sense of what I'm talking about and what there is out there, the pink is what I'm going to cover today. And even that pink dot is probably pretty too big. I mean, the technology is growing in leaps and bounds. It's just all over the place. So if you expect to know everything there is to know about blockchain coming in here, oh, thank you for that water. Um, see me after the talk, okay? And then be ready to dedicate the next two years of your life to me. All right, so this is who I am. I've been uh, doing technology for a long time. I am a, a technology writer and technology journalist. I have production experience. The way I got into this deal is about two years ago, the editors at Blockchain Journal called me up, and I'd worked with some of the editors previously in other technologies, and they said, hey, you need to take a look at this stuff. All right, and I was coming from, yeah, cryptocurrency, what do I know? But then again, if I, 10 years ago, if I bought blockchain at $2, I wouldn't be here today. But anyway, um, and I started looking at it, and I said, there is something here. There is something here. And so um, that's, again, the golden part. The purpose of this talk is to share the something here. Um, all views expressed here are my own, not blockchain journal, not scale, not anybody else. All right, so I need, let's, um, for, uh, let's do some level setting. I'm gonna say some terms, and if they, res if they have some sort of meaning for you, raise your hand so I know who I'm talking to. Uh, user address, does that mean anything to you? Okay, good. Uh, um, proof of stake, okay, proof of stake, you've been minimally contaminated. Uh, Ethereum, okay, got some Ethereum. Solana, okay, we've got some Solana, good, okay. Gas fee, does that term mean something to you? Okay, gas fee. All right, uh, USDT. Does that term mean? Okay, so you, you people are adequately uh, contaminated. Um, uh, I need to share at this point also that I'm, it's not lost on me that today is the Ides of March and I hope to get out of here alive, okay? Anyway, uh, let's keep going. Uh, smart contract, okay. Okay, so you have, there's some experience here, good. Um, okay, how many people of you have used a crypto, cryptographic wallet, MetaMask, uh, Phantom, okay, so you got your wallet stuff down. Uh, I'm gonna ask the loaded question. Anybody own any cryptocurrency? Okay, so you so you've vid you've visited the exchange. Okay, anybody know Sam Banks Friedman? Okay, oh, all right. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, anybody own an NFT? Anybody own one? Okay, own, well, we got one person owning an NFT. Okay. Anybody who's done blockchain programming? We're, we're literally written code that's gone out to the chain. Uh, what chain, may I ask? Okay, Ethereum, uh, you've done Ethereum, you're using Ethereum? Okay, good, all right. Uh, and uh, any sort of application deployment created an app and actually had to put it out on a blockchain and maintain it. Ah, so I, I have something to offer. 
I have something to offer. All right, so now I know who I am. Okay, let's talk about the, the elephant in the living room. Um, yeah, cryptocurrency, blockchain, uh, it, didn't do, it didn't do too good. I mean, what happened is this blockchain stuff come out and immediately there's a whole culture that starts just doing nothing but luring people into gaming using uh, tokens and NFTs. Uh, there's whole city set up in uh, China uh, called Chinatown, and that's in Cambodia, where they just had people under forced labor doing NF, doing NFT trading. It was really, it's really ugly. And as of course, as we know today, the United States attorney recommended that uh, Sam Frank Friedman, the guy uh, who got um, convicted, be sentenced to next half century in jail. So this is serious stuff. And the fact that actually the government is saying this guy needs to go to jail for 50 years, uh, there's something there. I mean, it's not like, you know, this guy invented a new shoelace and he, for, he was fraudulent with it in sending people. Now, I can talk about that later. Okay, so here's, here's how the evolution of the technology works. You know, pretty much you had blockchain. And, block, and people, and granted, blockchain, it came out of nowhere and people made a, 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 there are some people that made a small fortune out of blockchain. Was, was there more increased productivity? Who knows? But there was just millions and millions and millions of dollars running around. And then what we call the blockchain bro, bro speculative currency. We used to be software developers, now we're currency, tra currency speculators. And everybody, you know, started doing all that. And there was a lot of activity around that. And there still is, and there was Dogecoin and all the dog stuff. And it was not pretty. Granted, it was not pretty. And then we had the collapses. FTX is the big one. Uh, Celsius was another one. Terra, Terra and Luna, where the money just disappeared. Excuse me? I can't. Uh, I'm so, is it relevant? Uh, uh, oh, oh, okay, I'm, I can't hear you. I, I just can't hear what you're saying. All right, so, and then we get to actual useful technology. Okay, and people say, well, what do you mean by that? And what I mean by that is this. Okay, you know, 19, 1940, 1945, we just, you know, atomized two cities into nothing. Okay, that was the initial introduction of that technology. And today, it's powering the world. So technology goes to an evolution where it can be start of a nefarious end and then ends up useful. Okay, it ends up useful. So that can happen. And um, again, and it, blo yeah, blockchain is here. Okay, blockchain is here. You got your IBM, you got your AWS, you got your Azure, you got uh, Hyperledger, which is open source. People are playing on the blockchain. It is there. Maybe I am praising it too much. Okay, so what uh, fundamentally a blockchain, we, anybody's used BitTorrent like eons decades ago, it's, it's a peer-to-peer -peer technology where a bunch of computers get together and they hold data and there's no central authority and on blockchain what happens is everybody has an identical instance of the blockchain. That's essentially how it works. There's no central authority. If, my, if this blockchain over here goes down, it doesn't matter. If that computer goes down, it doesn't matter because there's 50, 60, 70 others to take their place. So it's decentralized, and then you have to come to consensus about how data gets on there. Okay, and so one of the nice analogies I've heard is just think of a blockchain as a big ass Excel spreadsheet where you just have rows, and every row on the block, every row in the Excel sheet is a block on the chain. And as a row goes on, that row gets added to one spreadsheet, and another spreadsheet, another spreadsheet, and another spreadsheet, and another spreadsheet. Now, how does that happen? So let's look at this diagram. So Bob, me, at um, call out number one, I create a, um, I create a transaction. And I, uh, from L, L to M, I send them 20 somethings. We'll call them 20 somethings. And it goes up to what's called a mempool. Okay, this mempool is, is open. Any, when you get on the blockchain network, you get to the mempool. Then what happens is a node will pull down the transaction, look at it, make sure that it's the person that sent it is sort of okay, and then that transaction will be converted into a block using some sort of consensus algorithm. I don't want to go into a great deal of con about consensus algorithms. We can do it later if there's time, but it's turned into a block. That block is sent on to the local node, and then all the other nodes know about that block. And they say, okay, this block looks good, and if majority of the nodes say it's good, it gets added to everybody's chain. Again, I'm being very cursory. It is actually pretty complicated once you start looking at how consensus works. But there are 
consensus is known. It's pretty much known now. The big one is proof of work. That's Bitcoin. Okay, where they do some magical, ma magical mystery calculation to say, okay, I can now put this Bitcoin or block on. Another one is proof of stake, where no will actually put money in, put money in, and say, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. So I'll put two million dollars. So I better at least, if I'm going to fake you out, I better fake you out for at least five million, because I'm going to lose two million. And then there's um, also uh, gossip the gossip, which is the, the Hedera blockchain works on. Again, that's a, it's a really complex consensus algorithm, but it's cute if you want to spend time about it, see me later, and then it's proof of history. These are just one of the many. But the important thing is the block goes up, it comes down, the nodes reach consensus, and it gets added to the chain. Okay, so going back to this notion of a block being an Excel spreadsheet, what happens is that they're just rows. There's just billions and billions of transactions. So if you can see the ledger, another term for a, a blockchain is a distributed ledger, DLT. So you can see on the left side, Bob mints 20. Okay, Bob takes, oh, excuse me, there's a mint, Bob doesn't mint 20. There's, a, there's a, what's called the Genesis Mint. I'm like the US Treasury, I mint $20 and I give it to Bob or I give it to First National Bank or Citibank. And then Bob takes eight of his, gives it to Alice. Bob takes six of his, gives it to Mike. Alice takes four of those that Bob sent, gives it to Jane, and Mike sends some to Jane. And then what happens is you do a reconciliation at the end and you get account balances. And that's who owns this thing. We don't, I'm not gonna put a name on what the uh, token is or the currency is, we'll call it a thingy. But at the end, Bob has, at Bob, at the end of the wall, the Genesis block has 30 thingies left over. Bob gets six, Alice gets four, Mike gets four, and, and Jane gets six. So really it's just the transactions, add them up, the same way your bank account works. Okay, are we cool? Cool, am I doing good on the explaining part? Okay, I haven't been at scale in a while, so I'll be on you, I'm a little nervous, you know, this is like the comeback tour. It's okay? You could change at any moment. <laughs> Wait till the feds show up. Anyway, all right, so um, here's, um, these are some of them, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Hedera, uh, Solana, Avalanche, Polygon, there's more. I'm pretty focused on Ethereum at this point. I do a lot of work around Ethereum and I, play, I banged around Solana too. And there, there's distinguishing factors about all of them. The big one about Ethereum, which I'll talk about in a few moments, and the others, but Ethereum uh, supports uh, smart contracts where uh, Bitcoin blockchain doesn't. Okay, so what can you do? What can you do with a DLT? What are some of the commercial uses? And I've talked to these people. One uh, company I talked to was called Cario, and Cario is actively in the process of making it so all motor vehicle titles on all the state governments are put on a blockchain and immediately accessible. And they're working industriously at that. Another thing that blockchain's been used for is Canon is building a mechanism into their cameras that uh, once you take a picture, the picture is it's called the info, the image is provenanced and it shows a point of authentication. And this becomes particularly important when you're dealing with um, news and information. So for example, let's let's say let's say I'm out here and I take a picture, I take a picture of all you all, and then some nefarious people come by and they turn it that the room is empty. Okay, using AI. So when you need for me to provenance that original picture is important, is important. And Canon's building it into their technology. So this is, a, this is one of the many things when they said you need to look at it, there's something there, there is something there. Okay, so anybody can create a blockchain. Anybody can create a blockchain, okay? And the way you create a blockchain is you create a blockchain, you have what's called a genesis event, you create some tokens or you, uh, you create some coin and you put the coin on there and then people come and do their thing with it. It really is that uh, simple. It's not that simple, but it's really that elementary. So, um, how about some demo stuff? Demo? Yeah, let's, let's push the gods. All right, so this is uh, WebStorm here. And this is, I, this is out, all, all this code is out on GitHub in various places so you can download it later. And uh, this is a, a blockchain I made, it's called RestCoin. Um, I'm not selling any of it right now, don't worry, I don't want your money. But the way it pretty much works is you create the chain, you create a blockchain, 
and then you add a, what's called a Genesis coin, you put the first coin out there, and then if you want, you have more minting events. Okay, you, we can look at this code, but it really is, and you might say, is this code, is this, am I talking to the blockchain? And as you'll, I'll show you in a moment, the way you interact with the blockchain is through APIs and through client libraries. And these are all, oh, there's, these are not secrets. Some of them are pretty complex, but anybody can do it. So, as I'm going to do now, I'm going to go the blockchain tests. Again, what it's going to do is it's going to create the blockchain, it's going to add a transaction, and then I'm going to make 2,000 wrestle coins right before your very eyes. Ta da! I'm now rich. I thought it was a pretty good joke. I thought it was. Reasonable. All right, so the point is there are, there are 2,000 coins out there now. Now, the question is, well, why aren't I rich? Well, the reason is this is just one blockchain. In order for this to have legs, I'd have to get 50, 60 people to adopt it. That's one thing, or 50, 60 nodes out there saying, okay, I want copies of this. And then, and this is where it gets a little financially, financial stuff, I'd have to be able to sell it or at least have some sort of value determination. Like, what could I get if I had, if I had a... Um, Oh, if I, set up a, if I set up a latte shop and people wanted to just, you know, tell me, tell me something nice about myself and I gave them two wrestle coins, right, and I put it into their account and they tell me, come in and tell me nice things about myself, then that, that, that coin has some sort of currency. But it's just not as, but, so it's not as easy just putting something on the blockchain. Adoption is critical. Adoption is critical. Okay. But aren't you impressed? I just did the blockchain right before your very eyes. Oh, thank you for thank you for clapping. I feel encouraged. Yay! Uh, <laughs> a minor blockchain. All right. All right. So this is you can set up. Anybody can join. Uh, anybody can join Bitcoin and join Ethereum. Uh, pretty much what you need is you need a uh, you know you need you need two terabytes. You need some RAM. That's probably not enough. That's probably not enough. Um, and then you need to keep that machine going all the time. You need to keep that machine going all the time, or machines going all the time. And then the question becomes, well, how do I make money, and how does all this stuff work? And I'm going to get to that in a minute. And again, I don't want to focus too much on making money, but what really becomes interesting is the notion of compute costs. Who absorbs compute costs? Okay. Okay, so now... I have to do, I have to do a, a little, little monetary uh, policy here, and that, not, mo not monetary policy, a little monetary uh, mechanics. That's probably a better term. So the US, uh, United States Federal Reserve, what they do is they mint dollars, right? And a dollar is a coin, okay? And in its, in its um, physical version, uh, one dollar is just as good as another dollar. Right, if I, were to, I give, if I give the parking attendant a dollar, he doesn't care which dollar he gets. Yes, there's an argument every physical dollar has a serial number, but every dollar in your checking account out on your bank does not have a serial number. It's just a concept, it's, it's what we call a fungible token. It can be used for anything, it has no uniqueness. So the same with WrestleCoin. What happened with WrestleCoin, as you saw before your very eyes, I went out there, I created 2,000 of these things, and the only thing is nobody wants them for anything yet. Could change at any moment. Check the news. All right, and th this becomes critical to understand. These are coins, these are what are called fungible tokens. One of the bad things about the industry is they're very, they're not very good at naming things. They use the same term to mean different things. So for example, when you say, uh, you say a coin, they're not talking about the physical, they're A, talking about the physical coin, or if I put you know, a dollar, I'm talking about the physical dollar, but also the dollar is a representation of a unit of currency. It is the currency, it's a name. So things get very confusing very quickly and you have my sympathies, okay? So in this case, we're talking about a token. All right. Put that aside, we're gonna to come to that. Okay, now we gotta talk about actually how we do transactions on any blockchain, any distributed ledger, because a DLT that can't conduct transactions isn't. And, and for those of you that have worked with wallets, the way 
a um, transaction works. It's really, it's a public private key scenario. Those of you, those of you who've been doing security are familiar with it. And when you create a thing called a wallet, and I'll show you one in a moment, you create a distinct address, but also you create a distinct public private key set which is only replicable through providing what's called a 12-word seed phrase. And that's where you hear about people getting in trouble. And I'm gonna talk about at the end of the talk, security risks. So I go out and decide to use a wallet that supports the currencies I'm interested in or the tokens I'm interested in. And what happens is I, get a, I put in a phrase, I get a phrase back that says, okay, I've created your unique identity, here's your phrase, put it someplace safe, and then through the wallet, I can conduct transactions. I can also do it through code, and I'll show you that later on when I do some more demos. But the, this is where things get hairy because then people lose their wallet, okay? They lose the 12 key phrase, or it's also done in a hardware version. They lose the hardware, and that's it. You know, all my asset is gone, or it gets stolen or it gets stolen, the asset's gone. And that's, that's a vulnerability. And that, that immutability can really not be assuaged. Now, there are some initiatives coming around that are trying to do away with that. And for those in the Ethereum space, which is a blockchain, the way Ethereum works is they have what improvements are called ERCs, Ethereum or ERCs, and 4337 is one of them that will hope to do away with this, but I'll get to that in a moment. The way it works, create the public key, create public private key, the private key creates the transaction, send the public key in, the key comes down, they look at it and says, is this the user? And the public key can, can verify that it is the user. Here's the user, here's the key, put the transaction on the chain, and then it goes through a whole lot of consensus stuff. However, what becomes interesting is that you can use this technology in other ways other than cryptocurrency trading. One of them is to use it for authentication. One of them is to use it for authentication. And the way it works is that you can use the wallet. You say, okay, I want to authenticate using the wallet. And, mo and the modern browsers support extensions <laughs> for wallets. And then what happens is you can say, okay, log in using the wallet and you're gonna ask, the wallet's gonna say, okay, can, can, give me your credentials. The credentials will go down to the website. Website will do its hocus pocus and say, yes, I know that this, this is good. Let the person in or register the person or do something. Now, you probably don't believe me. I will demonstrate it in a minute. I will demonstrate in a minute. But before I get to that, I need to discuss fungible tokens because fungible tokens are another opportunity in the DevOps space and DevOps application space because fungible tokens are unique, okay? And what do I mean by that? Well, let's go back to non-fungible non tokens. Never mind non-fungible tokens. A fungible token is one token as good as the other. All right, and you've seen this before. So in the old days, New York subway system, you go to, this, you go to the uh, subway booth, you know, you give them in the, <laughs> the first, now I'm gonna show how old I am. The first New York City token I bought was 10 cents. I could ride the subway for 10 cents, but I did. So I, got, I go, I give them my dollar, I get my 10 tokens, right? And then I can get on the subway, right? And so there's actually, what's interesting is that subway token booth is also what we call an exchange. It's converting currency. It's converting New York City subway currency, U.S. dollar subway currency, into New York City subway currency. Anyway, but one token is just as good as the other. So who, who cares? But what becomes interesting is if we look, you know, Mike goes and he buys, you know, the subway, um, New York City subway makes 50 tokens. Uh, Mike goes and buys 50 tokens, uh, goes and buys 10 tokens from the subway, goes to the token booth and buys 10 tokens. And then he has a choice. He can go to Alice. And it can say, okay, Alice, you know, here, oh, you want to ride the subway with me? Here's your token. There's no currency. There's no value exchange there. It's a gift. Or he can say, hey, you know, give me, I bought it for 10, give me 11 cents for the token, and you can get on the subway. And it becomes interesting, but why would somebody do that? Well, imagine that you're going to buy subway tokens in the old days, right? And it, those of you from New York might have stood in line where there's 50 people on the line, and you have to, when you rush to get downtown, or you can out, you know, Bob comes along and says, you want to, you know, you want to get on fast? Give me 11 cents, and you give him your token you're on. So that's a utility scenario. 
not particularly relevant to non-fungible tokens, but let's talk about non-fungible tokens. A non-fungible token is something that is uniquely identifiable, it's mintable and uniquely identifiable. So let's take a look at this non-fungible non token. And yes, there are arguments to be had, but I don't want to do them right now. Okay, your car is a non-fungible token. What makes it a non-fungible token? It has a unique identifier. What is that unique identifier? It's the VIN. When the VIN mints your car, it gives it a VIN number. When it, when it mints another car, it gives it a VIN number. When it mints a third car, it gives it a VIN number. Okay, each of those are unique. And when you start trading cars or selling cars, that VIN number becomes very important. So what happens is Bob goes to the, Bob goes, take Bob the automobile dealer, sells to Mike a car, he's transferring the token based on the VIN number. And then what happens is that Mike decides two years from now to sell that NFT, that non-fungible token, to Alice through the VIN number. The important thing about an NFT is that it is unique and uniquely identifiable. Now think of the utility of that when it comes to maintaining employees at a corporation. What if as an employee, when you're, when you're hired, you're given an NFT that reflects you? Now granted, yes, you can, the security people would jump up on the stage and say, you don't understand, you don't understand. And I'm gonna say, you're right. There's a lot of problems that need to be solved. But conceptually, it's a viable technology. Conceptually, it's a viable technology. And I'm gonna demonstrate it as we get to the end. All right, so um, in, or in order to understand non-fungible tokens in the DLT environment, we need to understand a thing called the interplanetary file system. Uh, does that term, does IPFS resonate for anybody here? Okay, good. I, I have an opportunity to make another contribution. Okay, the interplanetary file system, it's a distributed ledger, but the distinction between a regular file server and the internet, interplanetary file system is that the URI describes the content, not the location. So what that means is, let's say I have a, I have a photo of me and I go and I put it on AWS someplace or some service, and that, that photo gives me a, uh, AWS gives me a URL to that photo. It's not giving me the photo, it's giving me the location of the photo on the file server according to the file name. If for some reason I come along and I decide to move the file to another server, that URL is invalid. The IPFS, the way it works is when you put an asset on the IPFS, it creates a hash code that describes the content. It becomes immutable. And that's an important distinction. So let's see here. Ah, good, another demo, because I see it's five o'clock, six o'clock, and people are getting tired now, and I only have 15, 20 minutes left, but I want to show you something. Okay, and here it is. This is called the IPFS desktop. And notice this, net, this thing running on my little laptop, if we were to look closely, you'll see up at the top, it's discovered eight peers. Well, this has only been running for a while. I had it running earlier and it had all 238 peers running. Okay, so it's actually going out to the network, looking at all the peer-to-peer -peer nodes, and it's actually bringing down copies of all these assets, copies of all these assets. So you might say, well, let's put something up on the IPFS. So I'm gonna to try to do that. Let's see if it, okay, let me go, let me go import. Let me go file. Uh, how about, we did blue dot already? Oh, jeepers. Does my, does my wife have anything? Okay, well, yeah. <laughs> my wife put all her uh, songs up here, so they're too big, too big. Okay, hold on, hang tight, I'm getting to it. Uh, let's go down here to uh, uh, documents. Uh, okay. D dumb text, there it is, dumb text. I'm gonna take it and I'm gonna put it out on the IPFS. And if you look here, you'll see there's the dumb text, oh no. But more importantly, if you look here, you'll see that there's a hash code. And that hash code is describing the content. It's not describing the location. So 
let me see if I can go here, uh, copy the CICD, that's the, that's the identifier for the asset, and I'll go, I mean, the Brave browser supports IPFS out of the box. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to Brave, use the IPFS protocol, okay, I'm gonna go here, and let's see, Gee, Mr. Demo God. Gee, Mr. Demo God. Oh, it's, yeah, so here, no, okay, well, you're, okay. Let's see if it works. Um, I'm not surprised, because you're gonna see one of the big DevOps problems coming up, latency. Because right now I put it on my local machine, but now it has to go out and IP, I, IPFS is saying, hey, wait, where's this stuff? Where's this stuff? So, Demo God, you won. But the important thing to understand here is that we have a way to put immutable assets out on a distributed network in a way that's unique. And when this becomes important, when people say, I wanna get a picture of Will Shatner's x-rays, which he did, right? How do I know that's Will Shatner's x-ray? Because it has a prominence. I put it out on the IPFS at a certain date and that content hash is immutable. And it's a, again, it's a power, you're gonna see it in a minute when I get to the demos, but it's a powerful technology with many applications. Okay, smart contracts, game changer. The same way when you do a transaction on, the, on a blockchain, what happens is you have an address, you, know, you, have, you, have, you, have, you have an address, a sender, a receiver, and sender's receiver, a sender's sender, a receiver address, and then you have the location of the token at a specific address also. The way you can make, put intelligence on the blockchain is through this device, not this technology called a smart contract. And a smart contract is code that lives at a specific address on the blockchain and is executable. And that, I want you to think about it for a little while while I do the simple demo about the implications because the implications are significant. So let's see, what do I have here? Ah, okay, so this here, as you can see, before I go and do it for real, this is a Solidity smart contract. Solidity is the programming language that's supported by Ethereum. It's not supported by Ethereum, it's supported by the Ethereum virtual machine. And I'm gonna show this in a minute because the way you interact with a distributed ledger is through virtual machines. It's very rare to interact with it directly. You, you, there's a layer that the providers uh, put around the blockchain to make interaction easier. Very similar to the way the Java, Java virtual machine re, uh, abstracts away the operating system. So here, what you see is I have a smart contract, name the contracts, add operation, and all it does is add two numbers together. It adds an A and a B, it uh, puts the uh, A plus B and it returns the result. But what's also interesting about this, notice that there's a thing called an event, and the event is log answer, and I can emit an event, so I have a way to do event-driven programming if I want to on the blockchain. For those of you that are into those sort of nefarious practices, it's very cool, it's very cool. All right, so let's see here. Um, before I get to the demo, so the way it works here, and you're gonna see that in a moment, is that you, the app, you have an application. The application interacts with a set of libraries called the Web3 library. The Web3 library goes into an RPC interface. The interface interacts with the virtual machine, and then the virtual machine makes everything happen on the blockchain. Is it complex? Yes, but it's just so enormously powerful and it's part of the evolution of the technology. All right, let's go do the demo. I didn't get the demo up, let me show you now. Now, this is an example of how the technology is just evolving so quickly. All right, anybody here um, program, um, program at all? Programmers, anything? Uh, Visual Studio Code, uh, IntelliJ, right, okay. Visual Studio Studio, okay. Let's go to here and this, this is the development in my online development. 10 minutes, oh dude. All right, we'll, we'll get to this, I'll do the login and then we'll, anybody that wants to see the security issues, um, will do, see me afterwards. Okay, this is the um, development in my online development environment for Solidity. And what you can see here is what I do, I'm adding two numbers and the way it works is I compile the code, I turn it into bytecode. What I do here is I go down to deploy, 
And in this case, I'm going to deploy it to a local virtual machine. I could just as easily deploy it out to a test net. And I'm going to get to the virtuous cycle in a minute. And I'm going to, in this case, I have a local machine. I'm deploying it. And if you look here, let me see if I can make this big. It says I can. OK, can you see? And this is now going out to a virtual machine here. And now what I can do here is I can go to here. There is the exposure of the smart contract. I'm going to go pick a number, 13, pick another number, uh, 67. I'm going to execute the transaction. OK. OK, and now we're getting some congestion. Let's see here. All right, so here we go now. So let's see what happened. Okay, so we have uh, the answer is 80. Demo gods are beating me up here. Not sure why it's not showing up in the IDE. But if we look at the output from the blockchain, from the, in this case, the Ethereum virtual machine, it has a lot of information. Uh, here's the transaction. Here's the block. Here's where the block is. Here's who sent it. Uh, which is my, uh, my local instance. And here's the gas, and I need to go over this. Every, unlike traditional computing, where the owner supports the cost of computing, right? If you're AWS, you go in your equipment, you charge people to compute. The way it works on the blockchain and public blockchain is that you pay for the computing costs, and that computing cost is described as gas. So this is how much gas it costs to do it. Here's the execution cost. I know I'm going very quickly because I still do have a lot. But here's the, here's the answer, and there's the log output. And this is all information which is readily available for auditing on the blockchain. Nothing is hidden. And you have to, it takes a little while to get used to navigating around and figuring things out. But um, it's, it's a compelling technology. OK, let's think on here. Again, I don't have my secondary slides, but I do want to get to stuff. I want to do the virtuous cycle, and I do want to do the security demonstration. Are we doing OK? Am I going too fast? Am I getting, like, too hyper? All right. All right. This, this, for you that are, for you, <laughs> I was watching my cousin Vinny last night. For you that are into uh, DevOps, this, this, is where, this is where it affects your life. All right, so development environment. Actually, you can develop. There are uh, plugins for vi uh, Visual Studio Code. There's plugins for, uh, for um, IntelliJ. You can do uh, Remix, or you can use Solana Playground if you're coding in Solana. Uh, your clients or your Web3 clients. You can set up Geth to run local blockchains, OK? And you can also test your smart contracts there, OK? Where it gets really tricky. And this is for DevOps, where people are just pulling their hair out, is the immutability factor, right? Because once you put a smart contract out on the blockchain, it is unchangeable for the most part. Now, there are technologies out there called upgradable smart contracts, where you can upgrade the contract. But once the data is out there, that's another story. So they're just driving themselves nuts just about, how, how, how do I do development? How do I do development? And the way it works, from for now is you do development on your local machine, you run a local blockchain, then you go out to a test net. Under, under um, Ethereum, it's um, Sepolia. Uh, Solana has a test net. I'm sure blockchain does too. And then what happens is you also have to fund your usage. So and I'll just, just show this to you. I'll show this to you quickly. The way you fund your usage even on the um, No, it depend no, on test net, yes, no, on a test you're funding with virtual. Yes, five minutes. Okay, I'm going as fast as I can. Uh, all right. Okay, go on, go in there. Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, this what happens here is you put in your address and it will send you unusable currency to your address. All right. If you're doing real life test net development, you're gonna pay. You're gonna pay out of your wallet. All right. So that's how that works. So going back here. <laughs> Okay, do you get it? Here's the most important thing, because I want to show you one more demo. Immutability is the bear, and it's just a challenge to be overcome on the development uh, release cycle. CI, CD doesn't count if you just can't upgrade quickly. The other one is latency. Latency is still a bear, 
and security. If you want to know more, see me outside. Happy to talk about it because there's about 22 more slides to go. But let me, let me do the, the last demo here and then we'll go home and call it a day. All right, so the last demo here is called the log, is called the uh, web log, po 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 poetically, the web wallet login. And so I'm gonna go start, I'm gonna run the server, okay. Okay, running port 311, no surprises here. Okay, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go, this is my wallet here. Okay, right now I'm going, this is, you can see I'm at a, you can see this is my test, this is all my test stuff. I'm on Sepolia test blockchain. Okay, and this is the address, okay, that I'm going to support. Now, let's go out here. localhost 311, ta-da, all right. So this is login with MetaMask. So I'm gonna log in with MetaMask, and now notice what comes up, MetaMask, and MetaMask is saying, okay, it's asking for a prompt. Can I, will you let me do this? Will you let me do this? All right, and I'm gonna go sign, I'm gonna say, yeah, okay. All right, now, what it's done is it's taken the public key, I've sent the public key into my web server, and part of the public key is also the address of the sender. Okay, it's encrypted in I think the last eight bytes of the key. And so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go here. And um, I'll give you my uh, Bob, Bob WrestleMania one. I hate it when time, don't have enough time for good stuff. Okay, oh, it remembered me. Uh, now let me, here, I'll give you my other email address if you want to talk to me. Okay, and now I'm going to submit the user profile. Now my user profile is saved in my storage mechanism. Okay, and now I'm going to log out again. And now what does it know? It knows me, it knows my key, it knows my address, it knows a lot of things about me. I'm going to log in with MetaMask again. It's saying MetaMask, MetaMask. And if I changed the account, I'd have a different experience completely. I sign in and look who's there. All right. Now, now granted, there's security issues to be addressed here. No question about it. But the last piece, um, all right, the, the last piece is when you start working with non-fungible tokens. Because what we can do, and I do have a whole demo set up, I'm happy to show outside anybody's interested in it, is you can actually, the administrators can create a non-fungible token that describes the, the, you don't want to put a whole lot of information, but I could put a token that says, my token, very special, uniquely identifiable, and it says, the bearer of this token is at level two. Then what happens is when I log in with my wallet, my address, because it's unique to me, unique to my 12, my private key pair, will go out, the server will take the address, scour the block net, and say, oh, I know about this guy or this person. I know about this person. Oh, there's their NFT. And when I inspect their NFT, then I can see that they indeed have level two. And then behind the scenes, I can do all that security adjustment. So one last thing, I know five minutes, but let me just show you what this looks like. Let me go and uh, grab one more because I did this earlier. I know, uh, one minute, I'm so down on one minute. Let me switch accounts. I'm gonna go to another account here, 09, and now I'm going to go out to uh, someplace cool, testnet, right, this is, uh, this is OpenSea, which is a, um, a hosting service for NFTs. Okay, I'm gonna go this user here. I'm going to paste in this user address. There it is, it knows it. And look here, there's the scale. I, I did this one earlier, but there's the NFT that's out there bound to my user address. And then when I go into it, if I go out here and I look at details, and again, you gotta know this stuff, and I, there's the unique identifier. Think about that as the VIN number for the NFT. Right? And I look at it and look what it has. It knows about me. It knows about me. So again, uh, this is not meant to replace private enterprises, but if you start thinking about what this can be done for at the operational level, other than just an, you know, another uh, lo customer loyalty program, it becomes profoundly engaging. I have more, I've used up my time. 
I hope I provided value to you. Thank you for inviting me back to Scale.